everybody got another video here for you this is uh, another video about the truck and um, in this video I'm gonna tell you everything that's gone wrong in the build because you know how it is on TV they always make it look so easy right I mean hot rod TV or whatever TV show they're like oh yeah we just slap this on that's my torque spec and away we go and before you know it, they have a motor but Real life isn't always like that. So, it was time to get a, a vehicle running. And uh, I started by checking out the truck. And it turned out that the engine was seized. So, then I checked out the other vehicles. So, this is the Chevelle. It's a 1971 Chevrolet Chevelle Malibu convertible two-door it actually has a 1970 GTO convertible top on it top and frame um, it's got a tall deck 489 cubic inch 454 truck block engine big block in it but um, it's slated for rebuild and it's like a a set of exhaust header bolts away from ready to pull the motor. Motor mounts are already out and everything. So, so this one wasn't going to be the next one to be fixed. So then I checked out the Z28 here. This is the one new car I ever bought in my whole life. It's a 1999 Z28 Camaro. Uh, it's got a 305. It's all stock except for the stereo. It only has 60,000 miles on it. It's just ready for its first tune-up. Uh, but the engine on this one, what it is is the incredibly high humidity here and the car sat for years. And enough moist air got into the cylinders that pretty much all the engine seized up. So. so then I had, that left me with my commuter car which is a 1986 Porsche 944. It's an all-aluminum vehicle with, a, with an aluminum straight-six engine in it. And the trans and, and the rear are both at the back end of the car for better weight distribution. And it gets quite good gas mileage. It's got a, it's a close ratio of four-speed, as I recall, maybe a five-speed. But... um. It's also got a seized up motor, and besides that, it also needs a clutch. Thousand dollars just for the part. So that left me having to rebuild one of these four engines, and it made mo most sense to do the truck because it would be the the least expensive and the easiest to deal with. A little bit of a time out here, something I forgot to mention in the last video. Um, when I was talking about the stereo system, I forgot to mention how loud that thing actually is. If you look right here, you'll see a crack in the windshield. And that was caused by those subwoofers back when they were being driven by a 400 watt four channel Kenwood amplifier. And they're now gonna be driven by two 500 watt amplifiers. And they're actually dual voice coil subs and each coil can take 300 watts. So they, they'll take a total of like 1,200 watts of power. And I cracked the windshield when I was only running 400 watts. And now I'm going to be running 1,000 watts. This camera never wants to turn off. And you may be wondering how I was able to do that with just 400 watts. And the answer is you take the... You have a head unit that's got sub... Well, for output, like a nice Alpine unit or something like that. And uh, you combine that with a, uh, a nice equalizer so that you can actually 
shape your bottom end of the sound curve in like the, the 30 to 60, 100 hertz down in that area. And uh, you, can, you can really hit hard. I remember that I had a buddy who was into professional competition sound systems and he had a mini pickup. He put tw like twins, he boxed off half of the bed and cut a hole to the cab and put like twin 16 subs in it and all the amps and stuff too. And he was jealous because my, my truck hit harder than his did, so. But yeah, uh, equalization, it's the key. Yeah, his truck would hit harder around like 250 and stuff than mine would, but mine would go all, I could, I could boost like 30 and, you know, really, really shake the hood. And that's what made them jealous. So, all four engines were seized up. So I took the block, I pulled the engine out of the truck and I tore it down and I inspected it. And that's when I got the next setback. And that was that this has already been bored out to 60 over and there was sufficient pitting on number six cylinder wall. Why is it always number six? It's number six on the Chevelle too. Um, there, number six was in bad enough shape that it would have to be bored again to reuse the block and it was already at 60 over so that wasn't happening so this is now a boat anchor and uh, so that was yet another setback and so I obviously I ordered up a block from Summit and while I was tearing down the engine this uh, adjuster for this valve was seized and I never did get it out. I still haven't been able to get it apart. And uh, I actually had to take all the rest of them out and then I had to turn this thing around and around and around to get it off of the motor. But I managed to get it off without damaging anything. But yeah, that was the next setback and I had to get another one, a, a new stud girdle. So I had my block and my adapter for my crankshaft and all that good stuff. And I put it all together. I was going to put on the oil pump. This is the old one. And uh, apparently a, a milling high volume pump requires a longer bolt. And when I originally put the motor together 27 years ago or something like that. Um, when did I put this thing? I built this thing in like 95. 96 something like that um i didn't use the long bolt the longer bolt and it worked before but it didn't work this time and it actually damaged the saddle so here's the saddle and the short bolt and you can see how a lot of it broke away so, so then I was stuck with the damaged saddle and had to replace that somehow. Couldn't find anything like locally or online at a yard, machine shop, anything like that. Um, they had these steel saddles at Summit, so I got one of them, but then I discovered that the idea is you take the block and a set of steel saddles you send it off to the machine shop and they do a line bore and hone on it in order to get it to the correct size. And I needed something that was already a turnkey solution, basically. So I ended up having to get a whole nother block just to get the saddle off of it. And that's what's on the motor, right, motor now. And then what I can do is I can take this saddle with the extra block, put this on the extra block, take a machine shop, get it line bored and honed, and it's ready to go as the second block. So I didn't really lose that anything. I just have an extra block now. So um, that was another setback. So the next setback was, this is the original oil pan. And I wasn't able to get it clean to my satisfaction. So I was going to have to get another one. So I got another one. That was just a minor setback. So then, so I've gotten a whole nother block. I've 
got my saddle off it and put it on this thing. I've got the oil pump on and I'm going to put the oil pan on. This oil pan right here, actually. This is the one that I got when I couldn't get the other one clean. And I'm going to put it on and it doesn't fit. The, the back of the oil pan back here doesn't match up with the adapter. And I'm like, what's going on? And then it's like, Wait a sec. Dipstick's on the right, just like the truck's always been. And then I look at the block, and the dipstick's on the passenger side. I'm like, uh-oh. So, yeah, that was the next setback, was that I used the driver's side dipstick, one piece to two piece rear main adapter, and oil pan, when I should have used the passenger side dipstick version of those two parts and so I had to get another pan and the other adapter and I had to take it all the way apart all the way take the crank out and everything change the adapter and put it all the way back together to the point where I was ready to put the pan back on how's that for a big mess up so finally I got the pan on, the pan you see here, and I got the thing turned over, and it was time to put the heads on. So I went to go put the studs in, and the next problem I encountered was that the stud kit included three studs that were metric, not SAE. It was a mispick at the factory, and once I contacted our ARP, they sent me replacement parts out, no charge, so... Yeah, good folks and great parts. But yeah, that was another slight delay again and a bit of a disappointment. I, I was like, you know, getting a tap and die set in order to see what was up, thinking my stuff wasn't chased and things like that. So, yeah. So back in the late 90s, a couple of years after the motor was built, it had a uh, head gasket leak and got coolant into the number four cylinder and it bent this rod. This is a Childs and Albert rod. But yeah, it bent this. I replaced it with uh, Summit H-beam rods. But um, the coolant leak into the cylinder led to some longer term damage. And there it is. This is the number four cylinder head off the old track ones and if you see right in here it's bad enough that um, a good solid seal for the head gasket was questionable so this head was set aside and I had to get the track ones so I got the new track one heads and I tried to put them on and they didn't seem to want to go down and fit over the dowel pins, which led me to think that there was something wrong with the dowel pins. Maybe a dowel pin got dinged and had a burr or something that was keeping things from seating correctly. So I got a, I tried to, I couldn't pull out the dowel pins with like, you know, vice grips or anything. And so I ended up getting a dowel pin removal tool and fresh dowel pins and replaced the dowel pins on the driver's side and then tried again with the heads and the heads still wouldn't go on. I was like, well, what's going on here? And I discovered that what was going on was that the heads were hitting the piston dome when the piston was all the way up, which is the way the engine happened to be rotated at that moment. One of the pistons was all the way up, the dome was sticking above the deck, and the head would not go on all the way because of it. And so I checked it out, and it turned out, guess who put the pistons in backwards? Yeah, so 
So I had to turn the motor over, take the pan back off, one, one piston at a time, rotate the engine around so I could get the connecting rod, take off the cap, knock the piston out of the, out of the block, uh, take the wrist pin out, turn the piston around it, on the rod, put the wrist pin back in, turn all the rings back around, and then put the whole thing back in the motor again for all eight pistons and then put the oil pan back on and then turn it back over and then try to put the head back on again and yeah so yeah always make sure your piston orientation is correct if you've got dome pistons because they won't go in either way so the next thing almost doesn't count it's really to be expected in, in a build like this um part of the standard procedure is I took the old push rods and put them in and got my push rod length checking tool and checked it out versus the setup on the new heads here. And sure enough, they were not the correct length. So, and I got on the summit and ordered the push rod length measuring tool and used that to measure for the correct length of the push rods and ordered the correct push rods. So, another minor setback, but it's part and parcel of building motors um if what you want is you want it you want to luck out and whatever you played around with on your valve train geometry your push rods assuming they're beefy enough um your whatever length you've got it on hand or from a rebuild um hopefully the correct length and you don't have to mess with the measuring tool and new push rods and things like that So once I had the correct length push rods, I was finally ready to do a test assembly on number one in order to do a test rotation to check for valve clearance and then do a uh, uh, piston dome to valve clearance check using a gauging clay. And so I started assembling number one here. Yeah, there's the lifter in it still from doing the test. And the very first thing I saw when I opened the box So I opened the box and the very first thing I see is this important warning that says these are sportsman type lifters and not designed for street use. And so I got on the phone with Howard and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. What do I need? They gave me a part number, jumped on a summit, good to go. And the street ones are the ones that I showed in the previous video on the detailed specs. The ones that are out underneath the nose of the truck, actually. It's a good place to stash parts and keep them dry. And the difference between the two pieces, these guys are lighter weight, but they don't have, um, they don't have like a forced oiling system for, for these bearings down here is the difference. So there, you can run them, but not for extended periods of time, like on the street or stuck in traffic for four hours idling or something like that. So... So yeah, that's a race only part and everything I'm doing on all of my builds is all like for street machines basically. So it's got to be as high performance as possible, but it also has to stand up to, you know, street durability and, and conditions as well. I forgot to mention, see this nice pretty new valve here. Um, before I noticed that, when I was getting ready to finally put it on the motor, um, I noticed some, some excessive wear on the tip on the end of this guy, perhaps because the push rod length wasn't per perfect. And, uh, and so I ordered up a new valve and went through all the rigmarole of changing out this valve. only to later discover that it was tagged there and couldn't really be used anyway.
lesson learned, inspect your stuff thoroughly before you start dumping new parts into it. And this is the last thing that kind of went wrong on the build. Uh, if you look at this, this is a special undersized head stud washer. And they come in two packs and ten packs. And what's going on is right down here. this guy this guy right in here this if you look closely you can see how the the cutouts for the springs and shims and the cutout for the the bolt itself they're actually intersecting at the edges and this cutout for the bolt actually is deeper than these valve spring pockets are. And what's going on is the shim actually, I mean the washer, actually goes underneath these shims, these spring shims. You can see that silver at the bottom? That's the spring shims. And they're running you know, like 1.75 mil worth of shim or something like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was so tight that you have to get a special size washer. The regular washers, like, that's a stud, where's a washer? Over here, okay, yeah, there's, there's another nut. Um, the regular washers are like 0.81 inches in diameter, and the special ones are 0.75, three quarter inch washers. And on this side, I actually had to, come on camera, focus, there we go. Yeah, on this side, I actually had to um, remove these two valves in order to get that washer in and then reassemble the valves once the washer was in place. On the passenger side, I was a little smarter and luckier and I put the washer down in there as best I could and then gently worked it around, tapping it with a screwdriver, a large flat blade screwdriver and a hammer in order to get it to pop down underneath everything. And it worked. So, um, so yeah, that was the, the last setback that I've had to deal with. And then I was able to get the heads on and now I just put in the, the lifters. I know the, the right lifters. I put in the push rods. I know the right push rods. I've got all the plates and the studs and I've got the, the Loctite and the torque spec and everything. So that should all be very straightforward. And I've got the Felpro gaskets. Everything on this is Felpro gaskets. And it's all like ARP fasteners, at least to the maximum degree possible, except for the stuff that's Brodix. So, um, and then slap on the intake and that should be it. And I've run that type of intake and I've run that induction system before with twin 1150 dominators. And this time I'm stepping down to twin 390s cause it's still enough CFM cause this thing only sees like maybe six grand. So it's enough CFM and, uh, it should improve the throttle response. I might be sacrificing five or ten horse at the very very top end but that would be it oh let's see honorable mention i lost two two locks in the process of putting these things back together and but i'd ordered three spares so yeah can you imagine having to try to find one of these things when the spring compressor slips and this thing goes pew and lands someplace out in that stuff. Not happening. So obviously when things go wrong, 
I mean, things going wrong is one of the things that go wrong, you know, like, but um, you also end up with like a lot of parts that you didn't actually need and sometimes even tools that you didn't even actually need. So on the springs, at first I tried this guy and as I recall, I was able to use this in order to get the springs off of the old head in order to do that valve, but I couldn't get them back on with it. So then I stepped up to this guy and I was able to get the spring back on to the old head with this thing. And as I recall, I was able to get the, the springs off of the new head with this one as well, but I couldn't get them back on with this thing. So then I broke down and got one of these monsters that works when, it's, when the head's not on the block. And that got the job done. And the instructions for this large clamp actually said you were supposed to use one of these things to put in the keepers once you use the large clamp. But I found it wasn't really necessary. So that's a tool I ended up not really using. When it comes to leftover parts, I've got a lot of stuff. I've got this, I got a whole nother engine block with a with the steel rear main saddle to go with it. Got a spare exhaust valve that might even fit the new heads. I also have the oil pan and adapter for a first generation small block Chevy one piece rear main seal block with the dipstick on the driver's side which was only like the first year or two that they did the one piece rear seal that they still had the dipstick on the driver's side so that's another thing I don't need yeah there's leftover adapter and of course these sportsman lifters are leftovers that I didn't need to get So when I was uh, putting the springs back on the new heads, I'd take this thing and I'd adjust it so that when it was closed like this, it was compressing it just enough to get the keepers in. And uh, I actually had to use this handle off the uh, off of this guy as a um, extension for this just to get this sucker closed because the springs are reared at 625 pounds pressure open. So, um, so I get it compressed like that, get the keepers in, and then I put a piece of duct tape over the top of this thing so that if it popped off, um, everything wouldn't go flying off into the woods. And then I took this and I used it down here in order to slowly back the thing off again and slowly expand the spring and make sure that the keepers sat correctly and seated correctly. So, so that was the trick with this thing. And yeah, it was hard. I was thinking I'd have to call a friend or somebody to give me an extra hand trying to get this thing to work, but I managed to get it. Just took an extra bit of leverage, that's all. And this is the only other leftover stuff is a set of uh, studs and guide plates for the new heads. I lost track of them and had to order more and then they turned up. So, so in general, let's see, lessons learned. Um, double check everything, make sure of everything, and, uh, and keep track of everything. You know, I wouldn't have had to, I wouldn't have these left over if I'd kept track of where all my parts were. Um, if I'd done my homework and known that this was the wrong bolt, I would have gotten the right bolt in the first place. I wouldn't have broken that. I wouldn't end up having to get essentially a whole nother engine block. So, 
if I'd done my homework right, I would have noticed that it was passenger side dipstick instead of driver side, and it would have had the right adapter and the right oil pan the first time. Um, if I'd actually, I don't think that there was there might have only been on their website that it said that this was a race only part and wasn't suitable for street use but I'm not sure about that so so yeah it might have been a case of you didn't really there wasn't really a way to easily tell until you open the box or unless you called ahead to ask kind of a thing which happens from time to time sometimes you, you have high expectations for a really cool part and all the information available makes it look like it's going to be a go and then you get it and something happens it's a no-go i remember i got a um distributorless ignition system for the chevelle way back in the day like the first aftermarket one available and it was made for a v8 and it had like you know a bunch of coil packs and all that stuff and um <clears throat> and i put it on the chevelle and the chevelle had basically the same setup I've been putting on this truck, but with twin 1150s, and uh, the thing started blowing flames out the out the intake barrels, and I called the manufacturer and found out that it was a waste spark distributor system, so it was creating it, and it was designed to use with fuel injection only, and so but it didn't really say that anywhere, and so it um. So it was doing a spark both on the, just at the beginning of the um, power stroke, it was also doing a spark at the beginning of the, in, of the intake stroke. So yeah, so there'd be charge starting to come down into the cylinder and then all of a sudden it would fire off the plug and the flame would travel back all the way up and blow out the carburetors. It was kind of interesting to see it struggling, it was kind of like a galloping calliope and half the cylinders would fire and the other half would throw flames so but I shut it down real fast needless to say but yeah sometimes you can't tell until you got the part in hand and you get the bad news so and then stuff like the mispick bolt for the uh, head studs the SAE versus metric that's human error in the supply chain and that's unavoidable Yeah, and if I would ever learn to RTFM correctly, um, I never would have put the pistons in backwards. And then had to take them all out, turn them all around, put them all back in again. No real harm done there. I mean, it didn't cost me anything other than my time, so. And no parts damage or anything in the process. So if I paid attention to... Uh, the manual and put the pistons not in backwards I wouldn't have and had noticed it in time then I wouldn't have had to buy the the dowel pin pulling kit in order to mess with those so there's another thing I didn't really need and I'm not sure where it's at at the moment but I also got a tap and die set in order to chase the threads on the head when it didn't need it because it was a metric stud, it wasn't a problem with dirt in the threads. So that's another tool I didn't need. But that's a handy tool. In the end, it's like... I mean, the only things I can't really use are like, are like the, the sportsman lifters and the, and the driver's side dipstick pan and adapter. And everything else would be useful at some point in the future. So it's not that bad. And I didn't, you know, for a starting, at the, starting from scratch kind of build, um, I'm actually not doing that bad as far as, like, hits versus misses. So there have been a few. I've never done anything as stupid as, like, as like putting the pistons in backwards before. That's a new one for me. It's, that's it's exploring new frontiers and pulling dumbass moves when you're building a motor. I gotta admit, so yeah. When I discovered that, I actually stopped filming the build for a while. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I think that's gonna cover everything. 
So next time you're watching Hot Rod TV or whatever, remember, it always looks easy on television. So until the next one when I start playing with the valve train, everybody. Stand back. Where'd that rod go? Oh, there it is, yeah. That's a keeper. Everybody have a good one. See you all in the next video. In the meantime, go burn some rubber. It's Sunday afternoon. You should be out racing.